Hey everybody, Dr. Sam here, and today we are going to be talking about ear infections. So, whew, if you are a parent that's had a kiddo with one of these, it can be exhausting and trying and frustrating as well. But today we're gonna to be getting to the root cause and figure out why those are occurring. Um, ear infections are la the largest percentage of visits to a doctor with young, young kiddos. Um, it's just a very common thing when we have to talk about common versus normal. Um, with it being so common, yeah, it happens a lot. And why it's happening, it seems like even more and more, or even in the past, it's just happened a lot. So common being like, yeah, it happens all, all the time, but common doesn't necessarily mean normal. Ear infections are not normal. Uh, you might have had two kiddos and the first one never had ear infections and now your second one is having them all the time and just having to have rounds and rounds of antibiotics and having the tubes and having this and having that and like nothing seems to be helping them. So it's just kind of interesting if you do sit back and look at how some kids get them, some kids don't and why is that? And once again, we'll get to the root cause there. Um, with ear infections, kind of an interesting fact here is 80% of them are viral, meaning antibiotics are not going to work. Um, but all you do here is whenever a kiddo does have ear infections, they are getting rounds and rounds and rounds of antibiotics and then eventually probably the tubes, which we'll get into later. But with 80% um, of ear infections being viral and antibiotics is what is the medication given, it's not gonna do anything. Yeah, it might appear that it's doing something because the antibiotic is going in there and knocking other things out. But once again, it's not doing it. And so like they usually say like with an ear infection, wait about three days because the body will start to build its own immune system to fight off that virus and to help take care of it itself versus just jumping in, doing the antibiotics and putting them on another round. Um, the thing with that is, is like whenever a child is put on a set of antibiotics with an ear infection, did they even take a culture? So if you are sitting in a doctor's office and you're sitting there and your kiddo has an ear infection and they just look and say, yep, ear infection, here's some antibiotics. Don't be afraid to say you didn't even take a culture. So how do you know if it's viral or bacterial? Because there is a 20% chance that it can be a bacterial ear infection. But like I say, 80% of the time it's a virus, so the antibiotic's not going to do anything. And so with the, with like kind of waiting it out on that, I know it can be aggravating for the kids, but that's why we're gonna get into other things that you can do for an ear infection versus just taking the antibiotic. Because if we just let the immune system build and take care of that virus on its own, the immune system for that child's gonna be stronger too. Um, the things with like antibiotics, I'm just going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here and how things have developed in our country. I am not against antibiotics whatsoever. They have saved lives. They are saving lives today. I have taken them personally myself, but whenever they are prescribed and become routine use and given over and over and over to a kid that has come in six, seven, eight, nine times for an ear infection, don't you think that that's probably a sign that it's not the antibiotics are not working. And each round that a kid is given antibiotics, it increases the resistance. Their body then has to have more. It has to have more antibiotics to fight the next one because it's suppressing the regular antibodies within their own immune system. And these, and these um, bacterial infections, they're getting smarter. Their resistance is increasing to these antibiotics. So like we're having to come up with higher doses and higher doses and higher doses, and that is not good for our immune system. It actually breaks things down in a way that just, it isn't good. Um, kiddos that have rounds and rounds and rounds of antibiotics to treat ear, infect and for ear infections actually are proven to go on and have, develop asthma later on in life. And so, like I say, antibiotics are not the devil, but they need to be used in the right fashion, or otherwise it's changing the nature of our immune system. And like I say, the more antibiotics the kid's on, the more their body actually like resists it and doesn't use it as it should because it needs more and more and more because it's been given, given, given those antibiotics. So like I say, not an anti-antibiotic person, but they're just used way too much in routine use. But the good news is today, I'm gonna to show you how those ear infections are happening and what's going on there. And 
ways that you can use different things to help fight these ear infections just versus rounds and rounds of antibiotics which are proving not to work and then the tubes and it's like we'll get into those things um, there are two actually three types of ear infections we're going to talk about one of them major today and that's otitis media that's the most common type of ear infection it's infection it's an ear infection within the middle ear uh, we'll get into it a little bit more, but I'm going to jump on otitis externa. Just on a side note, so ot otitis externa is an ear infection on the outer part of the ear. And so we see this a lot with like, excuse me, swimmer's ear. So like a lot of water getting around the ear and it's not, maybe not, not drying out as it should and it kind of just gets infected, gets a little inflamed and isn't very happy. So that's just otitis externa, meaning external, otitis media, meaning middle ear. So that's the one that we're going to talk about today. Um, otitis media is where fluid gets accumulated and fills up just like beyond we're gonna do a diagram here but fluid fills up beyond that eardrum and then it stays there and doesn't drain out as it should and so whenever that fluid stays there in a stasis it allows for that to kind of fester and become infected if the proper drainage isn't happening and so with that we're going to talk about how is that just staying there why is the fluid just hanging out when our bodies are made to drain um, and like the fluid that remains there our body is 80 percent fluid the way that it is we're 80 percent water so like fluid is a good thing and it is right in certain spots but whenever it gets accumulated and just sits there that's when bad things happen like it getting infected because with our body it's a cool kind of self-healing mechanism and Fluid gets shunt here, fluid gets driven over here, it drains from over here, it drains from there, it sits in areas that it needs to sit in for a certain amount of time, so like those parts of the immune system can do everything that they can do before they move it on to the next system or the next portal. Um, so fluid's a good thing, but once again, like I've mentioned, if it stays in a certain spot for too long, it's gonna get infected and it's gonna cause issues. So, um, and don't mind me looking down, I got all my notes over here. So we've talked about that. So. Um, with ear infections and your kiddo coming in there's going to be always these signs that present along with in ear infections so if you're a mom at home or a dad at home and you're like gosh like baby just seems really fussy today or the kiddo seems really fussy today what's going on and like you're doing this you're doing that you're checking this you're checking that some of the things you can look for is fever about 50 percent of my clients that come in and they present and they're coming in for ear infections they usually have a fever um, because the body's just in there trying to fight whatever is going on so our internal temperature will raise to try to like i say burn off fight off the things that don't need to be there you'll also see ear infections commonly with teething babies teething kiddos because we all have seen a teething kid, the amount of drool and fluid that comes out of them, it's like, holy cow, um, but it's cute. But as you can imagine, that increase of fluid for the teething process, our teeth are right here, right where all that's happening, guess how close that is to like our ears. So with an increase in an accumulation of fluid for the teething, there's gonna be an accumulation of fluid up within those parts and the parts of the brain, not brain, I'm sorry, skull and stuff like that, that like to reside out. And another thing on like riding the coattails of that is congestion. So congestion is just like once again accumulation of fluid. It's going to cause inflammation within like the cranial bones and stuff like that. All those different sinuses are going to get more accumulated with fluid and all that just kind of becomes this vicious storm of just so much fluid everywhere that just isn't draining properly. My thing to get across today is to educate you on how we can get those ears to drain properly so they can make it to the next you know avenue which is the adenoids and the tonsils and then from there down to the lungs and it's like once everything kind of moves and trickles and drains in a fashion and at a pace because we'll talk about what tubes do and at a pace that the body can adapt to and utilize and do it naturally everything works at it should as it should whenever we have too much accumulation in a certain spot and we go there and try and we whoosh it out with um tubes you're going to see how that's going to impact those other areas of the body that are actually helping with you know the movement of the fluid within the body so um well, like I said, with the whole process, we just need to keep that fluid moving. We need to keep it pushing through. We don't want it to stay because once in anywhere, anytime fluid stays stasis, and what I mean by stasis is just calm, still, right there, it's going to accumulate so much infectious material and cause infections. So let's go ahead and get 
Okay, I am back. I realized I didn't have all of my markers. So we're gonna go ahead and get started on this drawing. So that way you guys are able to find and see where that missing link is happening with these ear infections in these kiddos. So please remember I am not an artist. I am a chiropractor, so my drawing is not that great. My stick people are horrible too. So here we go. Okay, we have our ear. Isn't that a good ear? I know, right? And within the ear, we have a tube that is residing within there called the eustachian tube or the E-tube is what many pediatricians call it. So we have the eustachian tube. So, and within that eustachian tube, we are going to have that ear drum. Remember me talking about fluid getting built up behind that ear drum? This is where the ear drum resides. Uh, many of us have heard of the eardrum, punctured an eardrum, stuff like that. Um, it's what people, what doctors will look in and see and they'll be able to tell if it's red and inflamed and it looks like it's swollen. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about, the eardrum. We'll get to the eardrum whenever we talk about those tubes again. And so just bear with me on that. But here is the good old eardrum. So... Beyond that eardrum, what we're talking about with the otitis media, so anything beyond the eardrum going in more towards midline of our uh, head and stuff like that, that's going to be the inner ear. So this is the whole inner ear here. Middle ear, I should say. And within that middle ear is where that fluid in the blue here is going to accumulate. So with that, as you can see, this eustachian tube is horizontal in kiddos, and in adults it starts to angle down. Many pediatricians and medical, other medical professionals will blame these ear infections on that tube being horizontal. Yes, that is true, that is absolutely true, but the thing about that though is that just because that's true, that doesn't mean that it's a good excuse. Um, that body and the fluid should still be able to drain naturally. Our bodies were made that way. And so why this is horizontal to start with, all of our cranial bones are starting to shift. They're starting to mold. They're starting to take place whenever we are a little, little baby. That's how we are able to get out of the canal, the vaginal canal that we're coming out of. But within that process of sometimes being pulled, and we'll get into like all things that cause, can cause the ear infections, but once that, the baby's delivered and now is here, those cranial bones, like I say, are constantly shifting, constantly molding into the adult and into the child head that it becomes. So within that, that's why this eustachian tube is in there horizontal for right now, because it's having to adapt to all those cranial bones taking form and taking shape. So yes, it is horizontal. Does a horizontal tube not allow for proper drainage as well? Yes, but still, we were made to allow that to drain naturally. So the horizontalness of the uh, eustachian tube is just kind of a, an excuse, and I'm not for excuses. I want to get results and answers. So that's what you'll hear a lot of times with other doctors saying. So moving on from there. So with that tube, we have the fluid that's kind of hanging out in there. If it doesn't drain properly, like we've mentioned before, it's going to sit there, become inflamed, and become infected. But why this isn't draining as it should. Let's get to the meat and potatoes here, the missing link that most parents are looking for and wondering about. We have a small muscle that resides along that eustachian tube, and it's a fancy like tensor villi palatini. I think I'm forgetting something there. Big fancy word for a muscle that it's hanging out in there and it helps control that eustachian tube. And so whenever that nerve supply, the nerve supply to that tube is irritated, is not getting the communication from the brain to allow to relax, and it is upset and becomes tensed and spasming, what do we all do whenever any of our muscles get tensed and spasming? Tensed and spasming. Same thing with this little muscle here. It's going to tense up and it's going to spasm. And if it is tensing up and spasming, it's gonna cause that eustachian tube to, to shrink down in and not have as much space there. That's not gonna allow for that proper drainage to happen because if this tube isn't the full capacity that it can be and to allow for that natural drainage to happen, 
it's just gonna sit there and it's gonna reside, it's gonna let that fluid remain and it's gonna become infected and it's gonna become inflamed and that's where ear infections are happening. That's where it's coming from. So it's once again this nerve supply. Woo. is not functioning sufficiently. And so once we take that pressure off of that nerve supply, the nerve is able to function as it should. This is gonna allow that muscle along that eustachian tube to relax, opening up that canal again, that eustachian tube again. And so that's kind of where those reside in. So with that though, Let's say the kiddo, we have drainage that needs to be happening. Um, we're now gonna be talking about tubes and like kiddos getting tubes in their ears. Fine and dandy, a lot of parents, you know, that's what they're told to do. Hey, sometimes though, how many kids have, had and gotten, have gone and gotten tubes and it didn't work? Do you wanna know why it didn't work and a kid has had to have two or three rounds of tubes on top of the five or six rounds of antibiotics that they've had? The root cause right here has not been taken care of. That muscle's still gonna be in spasm because the nerve supply isn't properly there. That muscle's still gonna spasm and cause that eustachian tube to be shrunken down in. So with tubes, the inter thing, interesting thing with tubes is that they go in there and they puncture that eardrum and then put a little itty bitty tube within there. So with a punctured eardrum, of course that's gonna allow for some drainage to happen. And how it does is that tube will go in there. It allows like some air to come within there and it allows that whole fluid to shunt out of the body. So if you think about like, we've all had like one of those water bottles or even like the laundry detergent that is on its side and like the little spigots on the end here. If you don't release the little um, cap at the top, it kind of comes out slow, just kind of trickles out. That's naturally how that tube is supposed to drain. But the second, like, so with the tube, you now have the tube in place, you're pressing on that spigot, it's just barely dripping out, but now you put a tube in place, it's like taking that top little cap and opening it up, and what happens whenever that opens up? Whoosh, it comes whooshing out. Fast, quick, gets the heck out of there. Yes, did the fluid get released from the body or from the ear canal? Yes, absolutely. Did it do in a fashion that the body is able to adapt to and to handle? Because from that tube where that fluid went, it has to go somewhere. It just doesn't come out of the body. It goes into the body somewhere. And where that goes to then, so we have the ear canal. It comes down and the next thing we have, and I hope I'm still seeing on screen yet, are our tonsils and adenoids and so whenever you hear about these kiddos that have had the tubes put in oh man i have a client that her little kiddo they went and did this and then for that and I'll, i guess i'll get back to the client let me finish this um whenever that fluid goes shunting out and whooshing out it then gets released down into these adenoids as having to take care of all of this fluid that's going on it might not be able to handle all the fluid that's coming in and being like rushed into its system and able to properly you know take on and what's the word filter and like use it as it should like the body body naturally knows how to do so then it's these kiddos that then that now they have the sore throats they have the constant sore throats the constant you know achiness down there and what do some doctors then go and do or well, now we're just going to remove those so now we're removing tonsils when they don't need to be removed we're removing adenoids that don't need to be moved and now whenever that these guys aren't able to do what they're supposed to do i'll label these tonsils it now goes down and gets into our lungs and then our lungs are the things that are down there having to take all of this extra fluid and get rid of it somehow because our lungs aren't supposed to have fluid within it either but there is just a basic natural flow of fluid naturally that if everything's operating the way that it should the body can handle those simple easy doses of drainage and usually then like if it gets down into lungs we might have a slight cough that they're able to get it out but whenever this gets all the way down into those lungs these kiddos then are going to show so, going to show i mean signs and issues with croup they're going to have horrible issues with croup bronchitis pneumonia i've seen a young girl as, as little as the age of two with childhood pneumonia and then asthma 
whenever, you know, like, and now these lungs are having to adapt to all of this. These are issues that started all the way back with an ear infection, proper drainage not happening, to issues whenever they're young children and a little bit older from whenever they did have the ear infection to now having croup, asthma, bronchitis, and possibly even pneumonia, all because we didn't know how the proper trickling of this, uh, how this fluid was supposed to be getting out of the body. And so once a tube is inserted into that ear, it causes that whole shunting of the process to happen. Fluid then trickles down like a madhouse, affects the uh, adenoids and tonsils, they aren't able to handle it. Then it gets shunted down into the lungs. And now granted, this is years of within the making, but like years and years of antibiotics, years and years of tubes and never getting back to the root cause. It's never going to be taken care of properly. So a kiddo might be like, oh yeah, the tubes work, but now little junior has croup. This is why this is kind of the missing link to all of this. Um, it's a lot to take on and a lot to understand, but I hope now that you guys understand this missing link to this and are able to kind of process, sorry, I kind of went off camera there, and are able to process what's going on with your kiddo. Um, please ask me if you have any questions along any of this. It's a lot to take on, but I hope once again it just makes sense. And so some of the complicating factors, excuse me, complicating factors that we see with kids that come in with ear infection issues. And like we have mentioned before, you might have two or three kiddos, one of them had it, the other one didn't. Why? Um, some things it include intense birthing process, like you might have had a tough labor and delivery. Um, cranial pulling, whenever a baby is delivered, you know, either vaginally or C-section, they're having to use forceps, vacuums, pulling the baby out via C-section. That is going to start, to, those babies' little cranial bones are made to shift and move. If there's too much pressure and too much going on, it's going to cause those bones, the bones on the outside of the cranial bones match the bones on the inside. So if they're shifted and off and whatnot, it's going to cause everything within the inside of the skull to be shifted and off. So once again, going back to that tube, if one of those cranial bones is shifted and not molding as it should, that tube's not going to be in the alignment that it needs to be in it either. So that has something that, what, that we call like cranial flattening, which I think is a pandemic in our day and age and needs to be addressed. That's when you see like, and we'll get into a webinar about like the helmet wearing and stuff like that and allowing for that, the skull bones to mold as they should. Uh, another thing, nursing issues. If you notice that your baby is constantly only wanting to latch on one side, that gives this inclination. So like if a baby's only wanting to latch onto one side, they're always going to be turned to one side. If you notice your little one in the car seat's always turned to one side, that's going to let us know that something is going on within that upper cervical spine. And we'll get into how chiropractic impacts all of this, but we're talking about how things lead up to ear infections right now. But if you do notice your baby is always tilted or her head is cocked to one side or they're like I say nursing or latching only to one side, that is a strong indication that something is going on within their upper cervical spine and those cranial bones and which will then therefore possibly lead to those ear infections because everything just isn't in the proper alignment and so then that tube's not going to be happy and the drainage isn't going to happen like we want. Um, what else do we have? Tight neck, so the same thing. With, if you see a baby that's always kind of tilted to one side, we have a condition that's called torticollis, and there's kind of like a little spasming of the muscles on this side. So once again, that's gonna cause, even though that's gonna affect the muscles in the neck, that's gonna affect like even muscles into the shoulder, into the upper back. So things to just kind of be aware of, things to be looking at. Oh, what else do I have on my notes? Oh, and then like, we'll also see this in like our gas pedal babies. And what I mean by gas pedal babies, their nervous system is just stuck on. Their gas is pressed down constantly. They don't have time to rest and digest and relax and have the other part of the parasympathetic nervous system come in and help their body to calm back down. And that's kind of leading into how can chiropractic help with this? First and foremost, we can help with proper drainage because with the proper alignment and better movement within that upper cervical spine, that just allows for that drainage to happen in the body to adapt to that drainage better. It helps, chiropractic then also helps build immunity. Um, the nervous system is constantly and 100% interlinked with our nervous system. So if our nervous system, 
But how do I say it? if our, ner our nervous system is constantly interlinked with our immune system? There we go. Um, and so if our nervous system is functioning 100%, our immune system is going to be able to fight those infections and stuff like that so much better. And with that being said, with the immune system being stimulated and going well, we're going to stimulate, like I just mentioned, that parasympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system is in charge of rest, relaxation, digestion, growth and development, and immune support. So if all the, if that parasympathetic system is, you know, and like, I, let me go back to even here, parasympathetic relaxation, rest. We need this nerve supply to be relaxing up here in those ears and that muscle controlling that tube. We need that to relax so that parasympathetic nervous system needs to be kicked on. Young kiddos, babies, what are they doing in those first few years of life? They are digesting, they're learning how to digest, they are growing, they are developing every single day. So we need their systems to be more in parasympathetic mode versus sympathetic. And going back to those gas pedal babies, they might have had a traumatic birth experience and then like immediately like their gas pedal which is the sympathetic nervous system is just pressed on and it is going and it doesn't slow down so their body's just amped up and doesn't have a way to come back down without the right proper stimulation that chiropractic can help with in stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system so that's kind of how chiropractic intertwines within that and so what we look to and even like i have all of these and i'll post these um i have all of these little forms that shows and we can even go zoom in right in there we have sinuses and i don't know if that's doing its thing but we have ear infections and sinus infections and stuff like that that's all taken care of up within that upper cervical spine and it's just where the nerve supply is that's what it comes down to where the nerve is coming out of the spine or out of the skull and going in and innervating which means giving supply to what that um, structure is supposed to be and how it's supposed to be functioning that's all that the nervous system deals with it innervates everything within the body and so like, that's how chiropractic we're able to help with that um how we know how do you even know how do you know that like, that, like i have upper cervical dysfunction within my kiddo. How are you even gonna know that? We scan here. We do um, insight neurological scanning and it shows us each level that a kid's nervous system is being stressed upon. And usually with these kiddos, and I think I even have one here, um, this little one here. So way up top, lots of nerve interference going on way up top and, and way down here once again at that base of the skull. Oh, not base of the skull, base of the cervical spine. So those lines there are coming in and they are causing interference here and they are causing interference here. So that's just letting me know that there is some nerve irritation going on in those two parts of the spine and it's just not allowing the body, once again, the nervous system to function as it should because the spine is probably not moving in a way that it should and therefore causing those issues there. The nerve supply, all we need is good nerve supply to those areas and a whole host of problems will be, it'll be taken care of, relieved and like the body functioning once again as it should. Um, and with that, all of that being said, thank you guys for listening. I hope it kind of put that missing link together for you. But on all of that being said, with the scans, there's no, I'm just going to use the word, BSing in this. Um, the scans will tell us our way of examination of a child is much different than a pediatrician. They're going to tell us. And if there's a time that comes like, hmm, scans didn't show that, that's interesting. I am not above one iota of referring out to an ENT then, letting them kind of see with their expertise what's going on. But many times with these kids, it comes back all the way to the root cause of what's going on and finding where that subluxation is happening, finding where that nerve interference is happening, fixing it and letting it release and letting the body function and heal as it should. And once again, I should go on to elaborate, adjusting a kiddo and a young child, a baby, is so far different than adjusting an adult, like you have no idea. Um, a lot of times with these young kiddos, it's just applying a light pressure to their spine where it needs to be. And I tell clients, if you're to go grab a stick of the butter out of the um, refrigerator and apply your finger 
just a gentle enough pressure to allow that butter to start melting underneath your finger. That is the amount of pressure of how we adjust a lot of our young, young kiddos. Um, so there's, they don't have the muscle tension, they don't have the years of stress and whatnot upon the body, and they haven't been upright, so there's not gonna be, be as much muscle tension either. And so their little spines are just so much more gentle and easier to um, adjust because of all those reasons. And so there isn't the whole crunching, the popping of this and that. A lot of times it's just a gentle pressure. So I hope I brought light to you guys. I hope you found this very in, uh, informational. My, my whole thing is to empower and educate and I hope I've educated you on this. If you have any questions, don't feel, don't hesitate to reach out and call 402-432-7702. Uh, otherwise visit our web website or Facebook page at SJL Wellness and we'd be more than happy to get your kiddo checked. Even if it's just getting their spines checked and getting them some scans done. Let's see what's going on and let's help them out and let's help you guys out so mom and dad can feel better too. So thank you guys and we'll be with you next time.